All right, all right. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out on this snowing day. And good afternoon to all of you out there online using that opportunity to join us. I'm delighted to introduce to you today the Reverend Catherine Reinhardt, who comes to us from Fordham University. And the topic of her lecture is Constructing the Body of Christ, Anglican Ambivalences in Covenant, Ecclesiology, and Ecumenism. Welcome. Thank you. So you should, those of us in the room, uh, should have a handout in front of you. Uh, it's, it's basically an outline of my talk. Um, I tend to tell history as stories. And so um, the narrative form, sometimes when you are hearing it, can get a little overwhelming if you are trying to remember concrete dates or events. And so I've given you. Um, an outline that not only outlines the, the course of, of my talk, but um, makes specific some of the dates and events that I'm referencing. So um, please refer to that as, as you will. And can you all hear me in the room all right? Yes? OK, thank you. In his edited volume on the Anglican Communion Covenant, Mark Chapman opens with an introduction entitled, What's going on in Anglicanism? Now, to anyone paying attention to the internal politics of the Episcopal Church of the United States and to the statements and actions of our global Anglican brothers and sisters over the past decade, that there is something going on in Anglicanism uh, seems patently self-evident. At least recently, the something that has been going on with Anglicanism is most directly focused on this thing that we are calling the Anglican Communion Covenant. Just like the controversies that drove the Anglican Communion to the point of desiring a covenant, disagreements and a, uh, these controversies being disagreements, wide varieties of opinion on biblical and ecclesial authority, local autonomy and global interdependence, sexual morality, and social justice, the covenant itself has become one more occasion for polarization and disagreement. In, in a description that could very well characterize any of the theological and ecclesial themes debated around the communion in the past decade, Paul Avis offers the following portrayal of the contention uh, that's currently surrounding the Anglican Covenant. This is a quote. The proposed Anglican Communion Covenant sharply divides people of equal integrity and comparable wisdom who have the good of the Anglican Communion at heart. For some, the covenant is the best hope of holding the communion together, an expression for today of what historic Anglicanism has stood for ecclesiologically. For others, the covenant is a pernicious proposal that is completely un-Anglican and will wreck the communion once and for all. The covenant is seen as either a necessary development of Anglican ecclesiology or as an unacceptable deviation from it. Individual Anglicans who agree with each other on many things find themselves divided over the covenant." End quote. So in some ways, this reaction is actually not all that surprising. If the events of the past decades in the Anglican Communion have demonstrated how deeply divided this family of churches is on any basic number of issues, then why should we think we would be any less divided in attempting to settle our solution in mediating and finding you know, a way out of these divisions? In hindsight, the assertion uh, made by the Windsor Report that since a covenant would be largely descriptive of existing principles, its adoption might be regarded as relatively uncontroversial, seems comically naive. There's no shortage of accounts uh, dealing with how the communion arrived at this point. And there's no shortage of analysis of the text of the covenant itself both decrying it of the ruin of all that is good in Anglicanism, 
and championing it as the only possible hope for our common life together. Now, in what follows, I do not intend to rehash these arguments so much as to probe this ambivalence. What is it about Anglican ecclesiology, an Anglican self-understanding of church, which provides the conditions for the possibility of such strong, simultaneous reactions, both praising the covenant and both condemning it? My contention is that Anglicanism has long harbored a deep ambivalence about its own identity. More often than not, Anglicans have chosen to define themselves and their ecclesial identity ecumenically with regard to the, ch the church universal rather than to their own distinctive character. This ambivalence is often construed as a problem, and it may in fact be what is preventing the communion from easily making a decision on the covenant one way or the other. However, I will try to argue that this ecclesial ambivalence is not necessarily a problem for our common life. If it can be shown that the unique ecclesial charism of Anglicanism lies not in its distinctiveness, but in its ecclesial openness, it is possible to move beyond the alarmist rhetoric of our most recent crises to a more radically inclusive vision of God's church. But before I trace this trajectory, we need to give our story a common beginning. There are many ways to tell a story, as Christians of all people should know. The Bible has two creation stories and four accounts of our Savior's life, ministry, death, and resurrection. One story can be told in many ways, and the truth of the story is not diminished by this variety, but rather exposed anew through the distinct facets of each unique telling. There are many ways to tell the story of the Anglican Communion and how it arrived at its current situation, and where you start the story and which characters and events you emphasize not only shape the story into one of many possible trajectories, but they tell you something about the priorities and the assumptions of the storyteller herself. Now, I could begin the story at Lambeth, 1988, and the passing of the controversial and contested Resolution 110, which rejected homosexual practice as incompatible with scripture. I could begin my story earlier with the decision of the Episcopal Church in the United States to ordain women to the diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopacy, um, and the ecclesial conclusions of the Eames Monitoring Report and the Virginia Report as they thought about what communion meant in regard to that different ecclesial controversy of relationship. I could start in 1993 with the election of the Reverend Merwin Castle, a celibate but openly gay priest, to the position of Bishop Suffragan of the Diocese of Cape Town of the Church of the Province of Southern Africa. I could begin with an account of the rise of something called global Anglicanism and the rich expressions of locally enculturated Christianity witnessing to the Catholicity of the truth in Christ. Diverse global expressions that did not politely wait to appear until the formal end of the colonialism in the 20th century, but which were present from the beginning of British imperialism in defiance of and challenge to European hegemony. I could begin with the origins of the Lambeth Conference itself and these strikingly familiar questions of local autonomy, the authority of bishops, theological innovation and sexual morality here regarding the question of polygamy that occasioned uh, the first meetings of this conference. I could go all the way back to the English Reformation and the complex negotiation of competing theological identities, Catholic, Puritan, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, and its organizational ecclesial break from the Church of Rome, which was in many ways the rejection of the notion of international ecclesial communion in favor of local ecclesial expression. Or like the reformers themselves, I could go all the way back to the writings of our church mothers and fathers 
to thinkers like Augustine and his insistence on the mixed character of the visible church, its provisionality and the limitations inherent in it on this side of God's final judgment. The expedient storyteller generally begins this tale much, much more recently, in 2003, when the Diocese of New Hampshire in the Episcopal Church in the United States elected Jean Robinson, an openly gay and partnered bishop, as, uh, as uh, he, they elected him to be the bishop of the Diocese of New Hampshire, and when the Diocese of New Westminster in the Anglican Church of Canada authorized rights for the blessing of same-sex unions. Now, in reaction to these events, as we know, several provinces and dioceses in the Anglican Communion, either through primatial announcement or synodical vote, declared that a state of broken and impaired communion now existed between those American and Canadian churches and uh, undertaking these actions and themselves. And, but in addition to declaring themselves uh, to be out of communion with parts of the Anglican Church family, a number of bishops uh, from Africa and Asia began to intervene in churches across the Atlantic. Now, in response, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, appointed Robin Eames to chair the Lambeth Commission on Communion. And he gave them the mission of examining the nature of relationship among and between the churches and the provinces of the Anglican Communion in light of this perceived crisis impairing our relationships. Now, the Windsor Report concluded that at present, this is a quote, individual canonical systems of the provincial churches are ambivalent to global communion, rarely centripetal, looking outward, mostly neutrals, internal, and sometimes centrifugal, keeping other provinces at a distance. And it was this ambivalence that was identified as the primary problem in the communion. If provinces and churches could somehow become more outwardly directed in their intention towards each other, uh, it was thought that further breaches of trust could be avoided. It was the Windsor Report that proposed an Anglican Covenant as a possible solution to these problems of relational ambiguity. The report urged primates and various provincial governing bodies to, quote, consider the adoption by the churches of the communion of a common Anglican covenant, which would make explicit and forceful the loyalty and bonds of affection which govern the relationships between the churches of the communion, unquote. So because the Commission on Communion diagnosed the problem as uh, lying in unclear patterns of relationship, the covenant was proposed as the solution to how relationships could be made explicit. The commission envisioned the covenant as dealing with a very wide array of issues, including the acknowledgement of common identity, the relationships of communion, the commitments of communion, the exercise of autonomy in communion, and the management of communion affairs, including internal disputes. And it's this first task, the acknowledgement of common identity, which I believe lies at the heart of the continuing ecclesial ambivalence found currently in the Anglican communion surrounding th this idea of covenant. Now, in the past 30 years, there has been a veritable publishing frenzy of books on Anglicanism, Anglican identity, Anglican theology and methodology, Anglican ecclesiology, and the phenomenon of global Anglicanism. And I think that this in itself is rather telling. It demonstrates a pervasive ambiguity in Anglican identity. In other words, the fact that book after book can be published on the question of Anglicanism shows that Anglican identity is anything but a settled matter. And I think this ambiguity persists despite continued attempts by Anglican theologians to address it because of two particularities distinct to the Anglican family of churches. The first is the way that Anglican ecclesiology, particularly as a global phenomenon, is complexly tied up with colonial domination. 
Paul Avis gets at the heart of this problem when he asks, quote, is Anglicanism merely the decadent legacy of unprincipled Anglo-Saxon imperialism, or is it able to take its stand on and find its justification in the essence of Christianity, the Christian gospel? So Avis, his analysis raises the question of whether Anglicanism as a global phenomenon means something theologically, or whether it's just the result of accidents of history. Is the faith, this is Avis again, is the faith, practice, and spirit of the churches of the Anglican Communion merely a product of the accidents of history, a legitimization for reasons of expediency of the way things have happened to turn out? The colonial legacy has profoundly affected the crises of interrelationship that have led the Anglican Communion on its journey toward a covenant, but in ways that are not always apparent or straightforward. Provincial autonomy and the varying and distinct forms of church organization, polity, and even worship, which have arisen in the post-colonial churches, are often celebrated in Anglican thought as rich expressions of locally enculturated faith. And yet, without the overarching coherence of loyalty to the British crown, some ecclesiologists wonder whether these varying structures of self-governance and varying canons and varying uh, jurisdictional independence whether they render Anglicanism as an ecclesial system incoherent. If formal relationships of colonial dominance have ended, their effects are still felt profoundly throughout the communion. As Kwok Puylan has noted, quote, although we have entered the post-colonial age, Anglican churches in many parts of the world retain cultural representations of the colonial era. And Dr. Kwok gives the example of the retention of English clerical dress in climates that are not suited to high collars and layered vestments. Now, one of the sentiments that has characterized the Jerusalem meeting of the Global Anglican Future Conference, or GAFCON, was the emphasis that Canterbury is no longer the heart of the Anglican Empire. And uh, one speaker at the Jerusalem meeting uh, dismissed the Archbishop of Canterbury as a historical relic. The impression of continued colonial influence is not helped by the fact that the Anglican Consultative Council, which is sometimes thought the most egalitarian of all of the instruments of communion because it includes uh, lay participation, uh, this, this council maintains its headquarters in London. So in other words, despite claims of provincial autonomy and the rich contributions of global diversity through interdependence, the Church of England is often still perceived as setting the agenda for the entire Anglican Communion. In fact, nothing is more illustrative of this, illustrative of this fact than what happened after the proposed covenant was defeated in the Church of England by a majority of dioceses. It was largely declared in the press to be dead for the entire communion, despite the fact that nine provinces have already accepted it and adopted it. And that, that has happened. It's done. Now, it remains an open question as to whether the covenant is, in fact, dead, or whether or not the Church of England will choose to uh, revisit its decision later, which apparently is possible given their canonical structure. However, were the Anglican Communion to go forward for those churches who have adopted the covenant, in the absence of the Church of England, it would signal that Anglicanism has indeed become something else. However, British colonialism is not the only factor of global dominance at work in the politics of global Anglicanism. American economic and cultural imperialism and particularly the global projection of America's own internal culture wars have considerably complicated intercommunion relationships. It is often argued that antagonism towards the American church uh, stems from a kind of post-colonial anti-globalization reaction, particularly from the churches in the global south, 
at the so-called export of American liberal values. As a dominant world power, America exports all sorts of values, not, not only liberal ones. Um, the Episcopal priest and anthropologist Miranda Hassett has argued convincingly against the oft-repeated idea that, this is a quote, the increased global activism of Southern church leaders is a part of a long-term global historical shift in the center of gravity of world Christianity to the global South, unquote. Instead, Hassett sees American conservative dissidents, her, her term, and sympathetic Southern Anglican leaders as engaged in cooperative, globalizing, active work. Uh, to use a different characterization of Mark Chapman, in some ways what is being played out across the Anglican Communion is a reflection or even globalization of the divisions of American society." Unquote. In other words, uh, American global dominance means that American culture wars can imperialistically become writ large on the global stage. Hassett's astute global and political analysis shows that the involvement of some Southern Anglicans in this culture war should not be dismissed as simply reactionary, a retreat from the radical openness and interconnectedness of the global world into faith-based fundamentalism. Rather, Hassett sees the alliance between conservative American dissidents and sympathetic Southern Anglicans as a global movement in its own right, a transnational global movement that actively utilizes language and tools of globalization in an attempt to shape the future of the Anglican Communion into their chosen trajectory. Now, it's easy to see how the legacy of colonialism and the ongoing pressures of economic and cultural imperialism have shaped the Anglican Communion such that it is hard to point to any one Anglican identity. Um, Certainly the realities of global politics have literally shaped the various polities, the various canons and structures of self-government among the, the uh, autonomous churches of the Anglican Communion. Such a church is just structurally hard to describe. And traditionally, Anglicans have used this rather vague term, bonds of affection, as a way to characterize our nebulous sense of interrelationship that transcends structural difference. But cultural hybridities and the complex ways in which power and dominance play out globally also color the affection that is perceived through these bonds. Hence, the perceived need for a covenant, not only to make these bonds explicit and forceful, but also, among other things, to articulate a common identity. So this was the first factor that I think contributes to our kind of ambiguity in Anglican identity. The second factor, um, beyond just these historical accidents of colonialism and the structure and psychological pressures of dominance, um, is, is an Anglican reluctance, historically, to formulate a distinct or comprehensive ecclesial self-definition. Anglicanism has never considered itself confessional. Uh, as Paul Avis notes, quote, until recently Anglicans tended to make a virtue of their supposed lack of distinctiveness. Apologists for Anglicanism insisted that Anglicanism claimed no special doctrines of its own." End quote. So this is a classic move of Anglican apologetics, for in denying that Anglicanism has any special doctrines, it's a way for Anglican theologians to claim Catholicity for the Anglican Church. This argument aims to show that, this is quoting Avis again, it, it aims to show that Anglicanism is not some sort of ecclesiological aberration, but rather an authentic expression of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church." End quote. Uh, Stephen Sykes, another Anglican ecclesiologist, has dubbed this, this, this sort of apologetic stance the no special doctrines stance. It claims that by virtue of the fact that Anglicans have no special or distinct doctrines, 
uh, Anglicans should be de facto seen in continuity with the apostolic church. In other words, this stance suggests that to ask the question, what do Anglicans believe, is really just to ask the question, what do Christians believe? Now, in light of the, perce the perceived crises of the past few decades, Anglican theologians, while not denying this theological modesty that characterizes the no special doctrine stance, they've begun to argue for more specific articulations of the distinctiveness of an Anglican understanding of church. The argument is often made that instead of holding a distinctive body of doctrine, Anglicans have distinctive methodologies, ways of doing and using theology, distinctive sensibilities towards sources of authority, patterns of worship, and patterns of common life. But an Anglican sensibility isn't really the same thing as an ecclesiology, a systematic understanding of the church. And Avis, for one, sees a pragmatic need, in his opinion, to more concretely define Anglicanism. This is a quote. Our great need as Anglicans at this present time, I believe, is to have confidence in our Anglican ecclesiology, our Anglican tradition, and our Anglican communion. We need the assurance that Anglicanism is an estimable expression of the Christian church, that it has all the resources by the grace of God to meet the pastoral and spiritual needs of its members, that it has the authority to call to its ministry those whom it believes the Holy Spirit is calling, and to bestow on them the authority of the church. And moreover, that it has much to offer the greater and more complete communion for which we hope and work and pray. So Avis feels that in a, in a crisis time, such as he sees existing right now, the Anglican Communion and the Anglican churches need their own doctrine of church that legitimizes its existence and affirms its integrity. Because of the no special doctrine stance, Anglicans have avoided extensive teachings on the nature of church and instead just assumed the authority of the common inheritance of scripture, the threefold pattern of ministry, the two sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, uh, and the creeds of the apostolic church. And we've assumed these to be a sufficient expression of our ecclesial understanding. Now it's possible, certainly, that in assuming this common identity, Anglicans have not always been diligent in articulating our reliance on this common inheritance, which could lead ecumenical partners to question our stance on a number of teachings or doctrines. But beyond this, uh, what bothers Avis about the no special doctrine stance is that he feels that it's a platitude that isn't actually unique to Anglicans. And this is another quote. It is internal to the self-definition of any church that it should identify itself with the doctrines articulated by the early church because all the churches see themselves as existing in visible continuity with the early church. All churches would disown with horror any suggestion that they appear to manufacture novel doctrines of their own. Even when churches appear to innovate by ordaining women, for example, they appeal to biblical and traditional precedents and principles as far as possible in an attempt to show that what may appear to be an innovation is simply a development of what is latent in Christianity but has lacked the opportunity to be realized." Unquote. So as Avis rightly notes, all churches, even those that consider themselves to be confessional, do not see special confessional doctrines as aberrations from the common inheritance. You see, within this insight, I think, about the common understanding of all churches is actually what I think is the key to the distinctiveness of Anglican theology. Because it takes an Anglican understanding of the church to make a statement about all churches and mean all of the denominationally separated churches of Christendom. In other words, what is unique ecclesially about Anglicanism is its refusal to equate itself with the only true church. As Avis puts it, Anglican ecclesiology is founded on the principle that there is more than one church that is Catholic, 
that there are therefore non-Roman churches that are Catholic, and the existence of the Anglican Communion, far from being a negation of the creedal doctrine of unity, Catholicity, and, and apostolicity of the church, is in fact an instantiation of it. Now, this claim may not seem all that radical to us today. We've had many decades of ecumenical conversation and work amongst the separated churches. And most Christians, Protestant and Catholic, largely accept the idea that the ecclesiological other are in some sense Christians too, uh, even in a complete way. They deserve to be loved, they deserve um, to be accepted, they are, even if it's in a limited way, part of the body of Christ. This is a markedly different understanding of the church universal than that which characterized much of Reformation thought. Inherent in many of the separatist Reformation arguments was a rather self-justifying logic that this or that confession or pattern of ecclesial authority represented the full truth of the Church of Christ. In other words, many reformers did not see themselves as dividing the church into pieces. Uh, instead, they, they saw themselves as exposing errors that had led to cancerous growths becoming attached to the, to the united body. And so the Reformation um, was sort of the surgical means by which these diseased parts were removed so that the one true united church of, of, of Christ could be restored to full health. And what's different about Anglicans is that the Anglican reformers uniquely were very wary of this logic. Certainly they participated in, in much heated rhetoric against the Church of Rome, uh, but it, was, it, it had a different and interesting moderation. For example, uh, the apologist John Jewell he conceived of uh, ecclesial unity as unity in Christ, and it, this was demonstrated through a unity in the essentials of Christian doctrine. So because of this, Jewell was surprisingly moderate in his view of the Catholicity of the Church of Rome. Certainly as a reformer, he was convinced that the papal church was in serious error on any number of doctrinal points. But he also asserted that the Catholic Church had never ceased to exist in physical form. So as Jewell wrote in his defense of the apology of the Church of England, quote, the name of the Church of Rome is Catholic, but the errors and abuses thereof are not Catholic. Now the historian Norman Sykes uh, explains it in this way. Sykes says, it was implicit in Jewell's challenge that the Roman Church, stripped of such extrigencies and corruptions, held the fundamentals of faith and was therefore still a branch of Christ's universal church, albeit in present need of purgation and reform. Jewell's broad understanding of the Catholicity also helped him to avoid the factionalism uh, that took hold of some of the confessional reformers. Jewell answers the Roman charge uh, that the Reformation churches have devolved into competing sects uh, by asserting the full Catholicity of all of the major reformed branches of thought. Uh, Jewell notes this explicitly in his Apology of the Church of England. He says, as for those persons whom they upon spite call Zwinglians and Lutherans, in very deed they of both sides be Christians, good friends and brethren. They vary not betwixt themselves upon the principles and foundations of our religion, nor as touching God, nor Christ, nor the Holy Ghost, nor the means of justification, nor yet everlasting life, but upon one only question which is neither weighty nor great." Unquote. Now roughly a century later, the Anglican divine William Sherlock published a pamphlet that demonstrates a strikingly similar ecclesiology. In the pamphlet, which was entitled a Protestant of the Church of England, no Donatist, Sherlock answers the Roman argument that in separating itself from communion with the Church of Rome, the Church of England was behaving in a Donatist fashion. As Sherlock notes in his argument, the Donatist Church, which existed in the 4th and 5th centuries in Augustine's North Africa, 
was a church of rigorous logic. It tie, they tied the efficacy of the sacraments to the moral purity of the person administering them. And because of this, the Donatists understood themselves to represent the entire Catholic Church without remainder. Now, Sherlock notes that this is the very opposite of what the Church of England claims for itself, and that, in fact, it is the Church of Rome who proclaims herself to be the entire Catholic Church without remainder. As Sherlock asserts, uh, this is a quote, when the Church is divided in faith and worship into many different and opposite communions, it is a ridiculous thing for any part of the Church to call itself the whole and then to charge others, as St. Augustine does, the Donatists, with separating from the whole. So post-Reformation, Sherlock sees that it's just ridiculous for any one part of the church to equate itself with the entire Catholic Church. And his rhetorical move functions to put all of the separated churches on more or less equal footing. In fact, Sherlock makes a claim which is startling even by today's ecumenical standards, that it's the understanding, the self-understanding of the Church of England to be in communion with any and all Christian churches who want to be in communion with them. Uh, this is what Sherlock says. Do the prelatical Protestants of Great Britain and Ireland refuse communion with or deny communion to any church on earth without cause? We have nothing in our worship that can hinder any Christian, not Roman Catholics themselves, from communicating with us. And then, if they will not do it, it is their own faults. We refuse, yeah. <laughs> we refuse communion with no church, with whom we can communicate without sin. And it is no fault to refuse communion when it cannot be had without sin. And therefore, we are still in the Catholic Church, and I believe the best reformed part of the Catholic Church and we are members of Christ and have true Christian charity. So clearly it's Sherlock's understanding that the Church of England can be confident of its place within the Catholic Church. However, his ecclesiology is distinctive, and I would argue distinctively Anglican, in his broadly conceived Catholicity. The many diverse churches, distinct and opposite though they may be, all equally participate in the Catholicity of the one Church of Christ. For Sherlock, explicit sin is the only grounds upon which to refuse to share communion, even with the Church of Rome. And were this Church to be able to see its way to a recognition of the full Catholicity of the Church of England, it seems that he would be open to communion with them as well. Now this broad understanding of Catholicity is carried forward in William Reed Huntington's remarkable book, The Church Idea. Huntington's proposal is best known as laying the foundation for what would become the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral. The quadrilateral is often described as one of the key statements of what it means to be Anglican, but as Mark Chapman notes, the quadrilateral itself contains very little reflection on what is distinctive about Anglican identity. The quadrilateral was not originally intended to be a full and descriptive account of Anglicanism. In fact, Huntington held up these four principles as comprising the heart of Anglicanism, specifically because he thought they demonstrated that Anglicanism was not distinct, was rather the full instantiation of the most basic, basic principles of Christianity in general. So Huntington's main project in the church idea was to propose Anglicanism as the ideal national church for the United States. It was the one through which other American churches could be reunited in ecumenical unity. And in proposing Anglicanism as a uniquely unifying faith for the American post-Civil War context, Huntington's argument was that Anglicanism's distinctiveness lay in the fact that it was generic, that it contained broadly all of the Christian essentials that might be considered important for a bare minimum Christian ecclesiology and without any divisive confessions or divisive uh, structures of authority that would prevent the American churches from being reunited again 
Now, when the quadrilateral was adopted by the House of Bishops in 1886, it included a statement proclaiming its readiness, quote, to enter into brotherly conference with any or all Christian bodies seeking the restoration of the organic unity of the church. And likewise, when the quadrilateral was adopted at the 1888 Lambeth Conference, the resolution made clear that these four principles were seen as supplying a basis on which approach may be, by the grace of God, God's blessing, made towards home reunion. This was seen as enabling the home reunion, which is kind of a lovely phrase, right, of, of the churches of Christ. In other words, at least initially, the bishops at Lambeth saw the quadrilateral, primarily not as a, def as a full, complete definition of Anglicanism, but as the basic articulation of Christianity, of principles that could eventually lead to the ecumenical reconciliation of the separated denominational churches. Now, we know from history that the quadrilateral didn't do this. It didn't affect the reconciliation of the churches in the United States, and it didn't do this globally. However, following its adoption by the Lambeth, Quadru by the Lambeth Conference, the quadrilateral did come to be seen increasingly not as a statement of ecumenical principle and hope, but as a definition of Anglicanism itself. This is particularly apparent in the way the quadrilateral has functioned as a foundation for the proposed covenant, and indeed for many of the previous drafts of the covenant. Much of the material of section one of the covenant, the section that details the specifics of what covenanting churches affirm about their self-understanding and beliefs, comes directly from the quadrilateral. So herein lies the unresolved ambiguity which I believe continues in Anglican ecclesiology and which is com contributing to the ambivalence uh, that is happening in response to the covenant. One consistent characteristic of Anglican ecclesiology has been its refusal to equate itself with the one true church. And this has caused Anglicans to be wary of overly systematic and self-justifying ecclesiologies. The churches of the Anglican Communion are Catholic. They are Catholic churches amongst a wider ecumenical swath of other Catholic churches, all of which participate in the one body of Christ. And yet, one of the tasks assigned to the covenant design group was to create a covenant that could be an articulation of common Anglican identity. In doing so, the authors of the covenant document have enshrined this ecumenical and broadly Christian understanding, the principles of the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, and they've held them up as definitive of Anglican identity. In other words, the covenant has preserved something of our distinctively Anglican ecclesiology that conceives of Catholicity broadly. But in doing so, it has again offered to the communion churches an ecclesiology that is just broadly Christian, rather than narrowly Anglican. As one commentator noted, quote, none of the affirmations required of the signatories of the Anglican Communion Covenant would be impossible for Christians of other traditions. In fact, the Ridley Cambridge draft of the covenant proffered an open invitation to non-Anglican churches to adopt the covenant if they found that they could agree to its principles. In the text of the final draft, um, it's not quite so open, but section 415 notes that the covenant can be adopted by non-Anglican churches upon the invitation of one of the instruments of communion. Now, in my analysis, the covenant does not, in fact, offer much acknowledgement of common identity for the churches of the Anglican communion beyond that of historical accident. As the introduction vaguely notes, various church families have arisen throughout the course of church history, and the Anglican family of churches is one of them. In what follows, the covenant does not offer any strong assertion for why the churches of the Anglican communion should remain in relationship with one another, beyond the broadly Catholic fact that all of us are Christian. And yet this failure 
to articulate a denominationally unique Anglican identity is in itself a strangely unique manifestation of Anglican ecclesiology, uh, which makes no claim of exclusivity for itself, but which offers a broad generosity in the recognition of the Catholicity of other ecclesial communions. So the problem remains. How do you promote intra-ecclesial unity in a church family without relying on strong statements of denominational distinctiveness? Affirming that the churches of the Anglican Communion interrelate with one another because of historical accident is a way of denying denominationalism. If the specific contribution of Anglicanism is not primarily ecumenical, not first in reference to the entire Christian church, then Anglicanism will have turned out to be confessional all along, to singularly and uniquely be the fullest expression of church in distinction from other ecclesial communions who are church somehow in some lesser way. That Anglicanism has doggedly resisted this is a testament to its fundamentally ecumenical charism. John Poby notes that within his own context of Africa, Anglicans' ecumenical claims function to be profoundly reconciling, a unique witness to the larger unity of the gospel. And this is a, a quote from Poby. The vocation of the Anglican communion is not primarily to make many people Anglicans. Looking at the Anglican communion in terms of the Christian faith itself, one may desire to say that there is no special virtue in being an Anglican. To be an Anglican is only a halfway house to the kingdom of God. Besides, to revel in denominationalism is to undermine the credibility of the church as God's agent of reconciliation of all things to God in Christ. In our Africa, for example, plagued by divisions of tribes, races, and sexes, denominationalism only exacerbates the problem by creating uh, the problem of creating the human family of God. Ecumenism is a gospel imperative. So Poby's classically Anglican assertion that there is no special virtue in being an Anglican is very much enshrined in the text of the covenant itself, in its openness to covenant with non-Anglican churches and its broad description of Catholic Christianity. Because this denominational ambivalence rests within the heart of the covenant, I believe the situation for the Anglican Communion going forward remains fairly ambiguous, particularly if what the covenant is supposed to do is offer a concrete definition of common Anglican identity and make our Anglican bonds of affection explicit and formal. I began this talk with an acknowledgement that I would not be giving an opinion on the proposed co covenant but that I would instead be probing an ambivalence. And in this way, the history I have sketched for you has aimed to be neither polemical nor apologetic. I'm not arguing against the covenant, and I'm not explicitly endorsing it. Instead, what I find interesting in the Anglican covenant, and interesting in so many of the debates that have gone on in Anglicanism in general, is the great capacity our church has for harboring ambivalence. Colloquially, the word ambivalent is often used to convey ambiguity or indecision, not feeling strongly one way or the other. But technically, uh, the technical definition, particularly as it's used in psychology, is that ambivalence is the coexistence within an individual of positive and negative feelings toward the same person, object, or action simultaneously drawing him or her in opposite directions. So the proposed Anglican Covenant has provoked this reaction within the diversely embodied churches of our communion. In the strong arguments both polemicizing and apologizing for the covenant, it often feels as though our church communion were being drawn simultaneously in opposite directions. In my preceding marks, I have tried to illustrate the conditions for the possibility of this reaction. 
and show how different factors of Anglican history have led us uniquely to a place where two simultaneous yet contradictory impulses are possible. What remains to be seen is how this diverse, hybrid, intercultural history will lead us into the openness of an imagined future. Will one direction prevail over another? Will being pulled simultaneously in two opposite directions cause Anglicanism to split apart? Or are there other options that might help us escape this false binary? Is it possible, realistic, or even coherent to suggest that Anglicanism might be able to stand with its ambivalences intact as a testament to the very real ambivalence and ambiguity that is part of being limited and contingent and a creature. Marilyn McCord Adams reminds us that the human body itself, limited and contingent though it may be, is a primary analog for the church, particularly in the body of Christ image. Moreover, this body is inherently developmental. Cells multiply and divide, and they undergo radical differentiation in, server of a, in service of a richer, more complex integration. Interdependence in the human body happens in ways that are simultaneously distinct and yet interconnected. The gallbladder functions differently from and has no comprehension of what the ear or the eye are doing. And yet the health of one organ is tied to the health of all. Adams expounds on this analogy to argue that what makes sense to Christ, our head, might exceed our present comprehension. None of us has a God's eye view of the whole body. And Adams points out that it is hubris to suppose that we know which is the church's present developmental stage. Regardless of the fate of the covenant or the Anglican communion in general, Adams reminds us that the integrity of Christ's body is primarily the work of the Holy Spirit and so is not in jeopardy. In other words, Adam's primary caution is against despondency about the difficulties of unity. For as she notes, desperation about Christian unity borders on idolatry because it makes the idolatrous assumption that it all depends on us. <sighs> so I guess I will take your Questions now? Anyone has them? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> Is the idea that if the church is at a latter stage of development, then in staying in the metaphor, it became wisdom in the state. Mm -hmm. And um, that strikes me as a very apt analog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, so there's there's many ways to comment on that. One thing that I, I said earlier uh, this morning in some of my conversations with, with the faculty, that in my, my opinion, intra-church difficulty and unity, I think is, is, is really a part of the, the ecumenical church's inability to think our unity outside of these apparently so obvious divisions. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's why I picked Adam's image there at the end. And it's a, my opinion is not uncontroversial. Um, someone like Avis, who does quite a bit, a very good ecumenical work, would say that to, to try to talk about some underlying unity in God that isn't structural or isn't about us re, re, you know, reuniting is to not be working hard enough. 
but but I just think that our ecclesial imagination has become so so limited on that idea, on what we think are the given structures of church visibility and church unity, that um, that, that Adam's image is, is incredibly helpful. And in the best way, whether it whether it can be a coherent ecclesiology for an Anglican communion or not is, a, is another question, and one which I really don't know. But I do think that it's an incredibly power, powerful witness to say our common identity is Christian, period. That, 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 that to embrace our distinctiveness and our diversity is to insist upon that, that that is what makes us all united. And it's a... if. To make that claim is to also make a strong claim about ecumenical interrelationship, which um, is just not on a lot of our radars right now. I mean, it should make us think, well, why aren't I? If I am Christian and the Quakers down the street are Christian, why aren't we talking to one another? Um, you know. Patrick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not very ambivalent as to identity. Yeah. But, right? I mean, so, yeah, I'd love to Sure. Well, in my opinion, which not everyone, so, so Patrick's question, sorry, for the people at home, I'm supposed to repeat the, what was about the historic episcopate and whether that, in fact, is a, a broad principle of Christianity or whether that is some weird thing that Anglicans insist upon. You, I think it's possible to read it in that manner. Um, I would try to make an argument, I guess, that um, it depends on what you mean by episcopate, right? The word episcopus is, is about shepherding the community. And so we have stories in the New Testament of women working with Paul who were shepherding their communities. You know, that's a historic episcopate. There are many ways to interpret what that means, the, the historic episcopate. And um, it is beyond my capacity right now to give you biblical and historical exegesis of all of the ways to interpret what episcopacy means. And there has been, I mean, I think part of um, the Anglican agreement with the Lutherans, um, which ended up finally going forward, that that was the sticking point. That was the sticking point, was the historic episcopacy. And there are people that just kind of think, well, Anglicans think we have this thing called historic succession, and so if we can keep it, we should. So let's throw some Episcopal bishops in there with the Lutheran bishops, and they can get in on our magic hands. You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I strongly hate that argument or strongly agree with it. You know, it's, it is what it is. I, I do think that the patristic church their understanding of the historic continuity of the faith was about the faith of the church, which was that Jesus was fully human and fully God. That was the, that's the deposit of faith that the patristic fathers and mothers talk about. And in my own historical understanding of the historic episcopacy, that's the bishop, um, rightly or wrongly, because um, bishops, like all of us, are flawed, but rightly or wrongly, the bishop was seen as... Um, being in charge of caring for that, of caring for this deposit of faith that if understood rightly is profoundly important. And so that it's not actually about magic hands. And um, that's, that, that's my very broadly Catholic reading of the historical episcopacy, but I think an argument can be made, as you're suggesting, that it is less broadly Christian than maybe the other principles. Yes. Uh -huh. Out from what I think my, my understanding of why a lot of the problems are rejected in Britain mm -hmm. is because it seems to be starting with New Zealand that what was being said in the theological reflection was often very agreeable, but what there was very strong disagreement and resentment about was the centralization of yeah. decision making power in yeah. the ACC and the boosting of the role of the primates yeah. who were given a less conservative role yeah. than they even currently have. Yeah. So what it seemed to me was being said, and, and this is how I heard it articulated yeah. in the literature around the world, was that what was being rejected was a kind of authoritarian mm -hmm. leadership. Yeah. And can you reflect on that? Yeah, you know, 
there were many ways this talk could have gone, and in the interest of time and saving you all from listening to me go on too long, I, I declined, as I said at the beginning, to talk about the, the specifics too much. As you can see, I put an appendix on your sheet. It lists the churches that have accepted, adopted, or subscribed. They use different language, which I don't know how we want to interpret that, but they use different language in terms of how they are agreeing to this thing. And then there are the churches that have officially rejected it. And, and as you know, the, the Church of New Zealand felt able to subscribe to three, the first three propositions, and it was the fourth one for reasons that you said. One of the many factors of this covenant question, I think, is the question of a covenant versus this covenant. And the this covenant, I think, is, is you're, you're exactly right, is what many churches are, are reacting to is a, a more a more concrete systematic ecclesiology that gives more authoritarian power to our instruments of communion that make us more a distinctly denominational church that would make us harder to say to the Quakers down the street we're Christian you're Christian why aren't we in communion with one another um, Avis who I used a lot I, I think that he um, writes very well he he's not a perfect thinker as none of us are but he's made a lot of very strong apologetic arguments for the covenant. And one of them is that to him it's kind of a performance. It's a demonstration of a willingness to remain in relationship. And in my own opinion, as a performance, the idea of a covenant I find not objectionable. So it's that question of this covenant versus a covenant. What is the covenant supposed to do? But um, to say that even if we're developmental, even if we are undergoing differentiation in the service of further integration to, to, to make an argument that demonstrations of our interdependence are necessary, I don't, I personally don't find that an objectable, um, you know, idea. But does this covenant enable that performance? Are there too many drawbacks to this covenant as it's articulated? Um, I think the question between a covenant and this covenant is kind of where, where your observations are falling, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, th I think that's, uh, so, I don't know if I can sum that up quickly. Um, the, the question was about whether the, the covenant uh, is veiling a, an agenda um, that our less articulated patterns of relationship um, can, can keep us in communion without having to have the trap of maybe an ideology. I think that's fair. I think that there is a question about whether everyone thinks that our current patterns of relating to each other are working. I think that's the problem. Um, that doesn't mean the covenant's the answer, and that doesn't mean that they're not working. It may, it, maybe it means that they are working, and what we need is more ecclesial imagination uh, about this thing that I'm talking about, about what it means sort of ecumenically to be separated and yet united. Um, but I think I think that is the the the, the, the sticking point uh, in your in your reflection that that people that don't think it's working, and as Ava said, who are very well intentioned and who are trying and who maybe don't see the ideology, or if they see it, maybe they don't think it's as bad as some of us other feel. You know, there there are people that see it as just the lesser of all evils. That that because their basic position is that our inner relationship isn't working, that we need something. That doesn't mean that this is the right something. And it doesn't mean that they're right that our inner relationship isn't working. But I think that that's really wh where it comes down to, is we don't and we can't have a God's eye view of the body. 
but I think what the, the covenant is t trying to help is those people who are suddenly like, Hol holy crap, I'm a finger, and there's a toe over there. And I don't know how I relate to that toe. Like, someone explain to me this pathway of circulatory systems. Um, so it, it's, as I said, this is, that's why I call it an ambivalence. It's, um, it's incredibly complicated, and I, I really personally don't know what the best answer is. I don't. Thank you, Catherine Reinhardt, for your talk, and thank you all for coming. And now let's allow for some time for her to have some lunch before <laughs> that disappears. And, you know. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to take this off so I can use the restroom without being filmed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Miranda Hassett is an alum.